Florida State and Clemson, they want out of the ACC. So how does the SEC sound to them? You are Locked On College Football, your daily podcast on all things college football. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Locked On College Football. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day, and your number one source to stay up to date with the biggest stories in the greatest sport on planet Earth. Realignment, coaching carousel, the portal, and more. We've always got you covered. Today's episode is brought to you by Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little further? Ever wonder what adventure could be around the next corner? Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Check them all out today at NissanUSA.com. Got my guy Chris Gordy here of Locked On SEC. I think you can make the case pretty easily, Chris, for the Big Ten or the SEC. It feels sometimes like an either or and you know, whether or not this team fits into that conference or this conference can really come down to personal preference. I bet you could find donors and boosters at both schools who are in support of this lawsuit who are thinking, well, we definitely want to get in the Big Ten or no, we definitely want to get into the SEC. How would they fit into the Southeastern Conference? Well, I mean, first and foremost, um, I think the brands would fit perfectly from a standpoint of, um, you know, anybody who's made that drive down uh, I 10 East from, you know, the Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama area, you get into the panhandle of Florida, you pass through Tallahassee on the way to Gainesville or, you know, wherever you're going. So, I mean, it's, it's in the it, Florida state is in the sec footprint. I've, I've been to their uh, campus a couple of times and um, it, it's a beautiful campus. They've, you know, the renovations they've done over the years and all this, it, it, it looks like an SEC school. It's got a passionate fan base. Same thing can be said about Clemson. Now, Clemson's got all the national championships, you know, in you know recent years with Dabo and all that. So, um, and, and both of them have a natural rivalry with, you know, already SEC schools. So that that would be one of the big selling points. Is okay, this just fits Florida State and Florida. We preserve that rivalry. Clemson and South Carolina. We preserve that rivalry. However, every time I've talked to Greg Sankey, the commissioner of the SEC. He has said it's not about it's not necessarily brands, which adding Texas and Oklahoma are huge brands. Don't get me wrong. But if they were to ever expand more, it, it, the rumblings have been about more eyeballs um, in terms of like more states, not just um, more eyeballs in states. They already have a footprint. So, you know, every time this has gotten brought up, I, I've been told uh, somebody like North Carolina or Virginia would make more sense joining the sec because it's new states it's a new footprint as opposed to they feel like we already have the state of florida with the gators yeah there's there's florida state fans but the gators are a big part of the state uh the state of south carolina yes there's clemson but we got a lot of gamecock fans already so that's been always been the talk again it it, the, the the deal here though is if those two big brands are available would you you know hear them out hey i'll pick up the phone and listen to what you have to say absolutely uh, but I do think the SEC also does need to be a little bit, um, you know, like you got to you got to be a little bit cautious here. You need more Vanderbilts, to be honest. Like you can't have a juggernaut conference where everybody's awesome. Well, 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 hold, well, hold on. On on that note, I don't know that you can't if you're going to a 14 team playoff, which hasn't been officially ratified yet, and the SEC and Big Ten are going to have, you know, three to four auto bids a piece. I think there's appeal to a gauntlet. You can cupcake your way through a non-conference schedule, which is what a lot of teams already do anyway. And, you know, a lot of SEC teams have got a protected rivalry with uh, an ACC team, you know, Georgia, Georgia Tech, the two that you mentioned, and there, you know, goes on and on and such. I, I don't know that loading up the conference has a major downside aside from, you know, maybe a slight financial hit to the athletic departments of, of the existing SEC schools. Well, they're going to beat up on one another. And I mean, you're going to have more four loss teams coming out just by natural attrition of if I'm Florida State and I join the SEC and suddenly I'm playing Oklahoma, Texas, Alabama, Georgia, LSU, like I'm going to lose some of those games. It's just it's going to happen. And then in, on the flip side, some of those teams are going to get beat by the Florida States and the Clemson. So it's just you're 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 making it tougher on the 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 best teams of your league by adding more best teams. So it, it's just Again, like it's a conference, so somebody's got to suck. Like there's going to be half the conference is going to be, you know, 
sub five at 500 or sub 500. And so um, that that's just one of the challenges. Again, money talks. All these moves are about money anyway, Spencer. I mean, so that none of it even has to make sense about footprint or brands or what do you bring to the table or all this. But I just know every time this has gotten brought up, that the talk has been adding more eyeballs from other states. And, and that's where I've heard, you know, like I said, even West Virginia's names have been brought up. West Virginia, Virginia, uh, Virginia Tech, um, North Carolina. Obviously, North Carolina, you get the basketball brand as well. But th- those have been the schools that have been thrown about. Whereas, you know, the, the, the vibe I've gotten from Sankey is, hey, you want Clemson and Florida State? you know, maybe it's, that's kind of been the perspective. Which is kind of an amazing place to be because you've got two programs that have won three of the last, what, 10, 11 national championships in the consolidation world of realignment. Typically you would think, oh, that that's, that's a home run addition. Of course you would want them. And the ACC is just trying to keep them on board. But what it sounds like Sankey's mindset is if you don't have the right set of teams and certainly Clemson's going into a new state, I don't think it hurts to double down on a state like Florida, I think it's one team, one, one thing to double down on, you know, the state of Georgia, for instance, which is not as populated or have, you know, quite as big of a, a market size. You got a big brand, of course, in Athens, but adding adding Georgia Tech. I see we have a furry friend on the show, but that's that's okay. Furry friends are welcome here on Locked On College Football. That's we're we're staunchly in favor. So, I, I don't think it's a bad thing necessarily. Clemson would bring you a, a new state to be sure, but. It sounds like Sankey's mindset at the very least is hesitant towards, you know, just adding teams just to add. Whereas other conferences, you know, I think the Big Ten was very targeted in their approach. They wanted to go out west. They got Oregon and Washington cheap. They got the LA TV market with USC and UCLA. But do you think that the SEC's appetite for expansion is limited compared to some other leagues? Would they tell Florida State and Clemson, no, we're not going to invite you? Yeah, and that's been, you know, since Sankey, ever since the talk of Texas and Oklahoma coming in, is that they've been very um, picking and choose. You know, like, we we have the ability to pick and choose. We're the mighty SEC. We've got the best teams and all this, whereas the Big Ten were like, oh, who's available? We'll take them. We'll take them. We'll take them. And it's like, okay, like, let's stop here. Suddenly you're going to – if you don't slow down, you're going to be a 24-team conference and, like, what are you doing here? So I think the biggest thing with the SEC is ultimately it will not just be a Greg Sankey decision if they expand. The other schools have to vote for it. You know, to, to add Texas and Oklahoma, the conference had to approve it. And it took a lot for Texas A&M to come to the table and go, okay, uh, yeah, we'll let them in. Like, it took a lot of negotiating. So – uh, but the big selling point was more money for everybody. We're going to get this big new TV contract and all that. If you bring them in right now, it, under the current rights deal, it would be less money handed out to all the schools. So you'd have to go back to the ESPNs, renegotiate a new TV contract. And so, but just on the surface, like immediately, if you wanted to add Clemson and and and, and Florida State like next year, they could get out of their deal with the ACC and you wanted to add them. I think a lot of SEC schools are going to vote no because they're going to go, no, we, we want our bigger – cut of the pie. We're not taking less money. All I could think about when you talked about the negotiating with Texas A&M is Emperor Palpatine's, my negotiations will not fail. I wonder whose negotiations will fail in uh, all of this sort of stuff. I- I'd be hard pressed as ESPN is the television rights provider for the SEC now, which is, you know, painful to the nostalgic part of me, which is I don't know, 80% of my body, generally speaking, because I grew up with the SEC on CBS and such. But yeah. I, I feel like if push came to shove, ESPN would probably be willing to pay for FSU and Clemson, right? Well, you would think, but the S, the, the, the we're two years in now to this new deal that they agreed to, and they still will not pay more for a nine-game conference. The SEC has been willing to pivot and go from an eight- to nine-game conference schedule, but they need more money from the – when they went to Disney and said, hey – if we're going to do that, we need more money. Uh, Disney and ESPN said, no, 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 we're already giving you a billion dollars. We're not paying you more. So look what the SEC just did a few weeks ago. They said, hey, uh, next year, 2025, we're sticking with eight games again. They're going to keep kicking the can down the road until ESPN comes back and goes, okay, here's more money for the extra slate of SEC games. So again, it's um, money's motivating all these all these moves right now. But uh, I'm with you. Again, if, if you get that call and you're the SEC two big brands like Clemson, Florida State, how do you say no? But again, um, it's Greg Sankey and it's the rest of the SEC to decide that. Chris Gordy locked on SEC. Great, great stuff, Chris. Thanks for stopping by. Thanks, man. 
Coaching changes to the staffs in college football, that's being discussed. And prop bets, is the NCAA getting something right? We'll talk about that. This week's March Madness Bracket Highlight is brought to you by our friends at Nissan. Each week, we're picking one team that stands out, a team that's pushed it further than the rest, just like any of the all-new 2024 Nissan SUVs. These guys were able to take it to the next level. The North Carolina Tar Heels can only be described as an armada. This one seed is as hardcore as it gets. No wonder they're in the Sweet 16 against Alabama. The Iowa State Cyclones, they're the Nissan Pathfinder, created a lane for themselves while being thrilling to watch as one of the hottest teams in the country ahead of their matchup with Illinois in the Sweet 16, and the NC State Wolfpack are obviously this week's Nissan Rogue. The team absolutely surprised us all with a powerful performance in their first two games of the tournament. Wins over Oakland and Texas Tech, not in that order, have set up a Sweet 16 showdown with Marquette. They say win life, go Rogue, and that's what the Wolfpack have done here. Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop at NissanUSA.com. This episode also brought to you by Better Together. So, Is your bracket already busted? Mine is in like a major, major way. Tired of the same old daily fantasy grind where you make a roster, cross your fingers, hope for the best, or you're just losing on the last leg of your pick entry? Introducing Better Together, the first cooperative daily fantasy platform where teamwork triumphs talent and you can play with your friends, not against them. I know when I'm on the golf course, I play matches against my friends all the time. I'd rather play matches with them against other people. That's what you can do with Better Together. That's what makes it fantastic. You pick more or less on real-time player stats, strategize with your partner to boost your odds and climb the leaderboard together. So grab a friend and join the social DFS movement. Download Better Together now from the App Store and sign up using promo code Locked On for a chance to win your share of over $1,000 in cash prizes. Remember the code Locked On because winning alone is fun, but it's better together. Well, pigs could be flying or sometimes the NCA could be doing something that's right. So sports gambling has been in the news lately for more than a few reasons, not all of them great. And NCAA President Charlie Baker, in light of all of these comments, and not comments, but all the Shohei Otani stuff and what's happened, you know, there's an investigation in the NBA and everything. And uh, Charlie Baker, president of the NCA, released this statement, quote, sports betting issues are on the rise across the country with prop bets continuing to threaten the integrity of competition and leading to student athletes and professional athletes getting harassed. The NCA has been working with states to deal with these threats and many are responding by banning college prop bets. This week, we will be contacting officials across the country in states that will allow these bets and ask them to join Ohio, Vermont, Maryland, and many others and remove college prop bets from all betting markets. The NCAA is drawing the line on sports betting to protect student athletes and to protect the integrity of the game. Issues across the country these last several days show there is more work to be done, end quote. I think this is a logical move from a former governor, now president of the NCA. You may remember Mark Emmert. Yeah, he's not president of the NCA anymore. It's Charlie Baker. So it's a very complicated issue. There, there are sports books that advertise on this very show. But what I think Charlie Baker is doing here is trying to get ahead of the curve. He's not saying, nor do I think he should say, because it'd be utterly ridiculous to say, well, there's just no betting, you know, on sports, on college sports in general. Like, no, 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 no. That, that'd be a bridge too far. This, I think, is a fairly reasoned approach because the matter he's referring to is taking place in the NBA. And what's happened is there's a player who hasn't played a ton this year, but the NBA is investigating because his underprops were highly bet on two games, one in January, one at the end of March, and he only played a few minutes in those games, actually left one with an injury, wasn't on the injury report. I I don't know everything that's gone down there, but certainly it raises questions. And when you have that issue at the professional level, and there's all the stuff with Shohei Otani, and you've seen NFL players get, uh, you know, suspended and everything like that because of, you know, improper gambling and such, I don't think that it is crossing the line or that it is wrong-headed to look at this particular matter, which is a part of society. This is going to be, and I think it should be. I think everybody should be able to bet on sports. Now, of course, not every single person, but I think fans everywhere should be able to bet on sports if they want to. But to say that 
you know, the line is being drawn too far. I, I don't think it is by eliminating the player props because if this issue can arise with professionals, with adults, with grownups, how in the world could it not arise with college kids? And you may say, well, just tell your kids not to do this. Just tell your players, don't do that. Everyone is clearly aware, and yet Calvin Ridley got busted, and Jameson Williams got busted, and now there's this investigation in the NBA. Again, that one is not uh, set in stone with, with regards to a verdict there or anything as I'm recording the show, but still, the point stands. I don't think it is crossing a line, and I think you are preventing potentially hazardous situations from arising. I would rather you be proactive than reactive. I think realignment has taught us that. If you are reactive, Pac-12, you can end up in a pretty nasty spot. If you're proactive, Big 12 and other leagues that are, you know, still around, you have a chance to get ahead of something and at least, you know, lessen the impact, right? The Big 12 was proactive in making moves, went to solidify their league, got their media and everything, right? They weren't, you know, waiting out for the big move. They were being proactive in the short term. That has paid off time and time again. And so I, I think that that mindset is a good one. And, and having individual player props, it's not as if there aren't still plenty of things to bet on out there. Because there still are. <laughs> you can bet win totals, conference championships, individual game spreads, Heisman odds. There's still plenty to wager on if you don't have individual player prop bets. But I, I, I think that, that Charlie Baker is in the right here to say, we don't want that moral quandary arriving in college athletics because you don't. And you can have gambling as a part of your sport, which I think it should be. I, I think it absolutely should be for fans everywhere, but not have that specific component. So uh, I don't know, you know how that's all going to resolve, but I saw that news pop up and thought, well, I think that's worthy of opining on here on the show. So too, is uh, this Ross Dellinger reporting over at Yahoo Sports, who does yeoman's work for those who don't know. Here's another change that's uh, potentially coming to college football. It failed last year. Uh, here, here's what Dellinger writes. The NCAA Football Oversight Committee introduced a legislative proposal this month that would expand the abilities of a football support staff, permitting all staff members to provide players skill and tactical coaching instruction, both during practice and games. The proposal introduced for a second straight year after failing to get approval last spring, like what? Eliminates the policy limiting coaching instruction to only the NCAA's maximum of 11, quote, countable coaches, the 10 assistants and head coach. Here's my initial reaction to this. It wasn't allowed already? So when you've seen your team, whoever you're a fan of, hire a special assistant or an offensive analyst, in that sort of capacity, are you telling me those guys haven't been able to coach players before? Why? What is the problem? Yeah, some some places might have you know a couple more coaches than I got news for you. That's not making all the difference in the world. The most important guys are still at the top, and I think that having someone on as a coach in you know an advisory capacity or an analyst role but saying well you can't do any actual on-field coaching because you don't have you know this particular title or whatnot like coaching staffs are collaborative efforts so all of those guys are working together talking game plan and everything of the sort I, I don't know why there needs to be a buffer between guys that aren't quite as official and the players that they are, you know, impacting anyway with the game planning they are involved with. I am a little surprised this failed last year. I don't know on what grounds this is not getting any support, but soon uh, everyone everywhere. Um, the proposal strictly maintains the number of off-campus recruiters to 11. Again, this is according to Dellinger at Yahoo but gives flexibility to head coaches to potentially designate any 10 staff members as, quote, countable coaches who are eligible to recruit off campus. Again, I think this is at this should be in the power of the head coaches. Who do you think is good enough to represent your university, your program to go out and recruit or to coach kids directly? I, I, I think that should be at the discretion of the head coach. I'm not sure why that's you know, a regulation there. I, I haven't been, I thought about it for several minutes going like, what, 
What is the de- if this guy's brought in as an analyst, tell me he can't talk to the quarterback. <laughs> like, what are we doing? What are we doing? I don't know what we're doing. So I'd like to see that get changed. It's you know a relatively small thing, but it's like putting the the communications in the helmets, which we're going to have in college football now, which. It's a pretty good solution to the whole Michigan and the sign stealing and the back and forth and you know this, but we know that and everything like that. That's a good solution. Or having the tablets on the sideline. I am not fundamentally opposed to change. I am opposed to change when it is not benefiting people. But I think these sorts of changes can benefit people. So not everything that's changing is wrong in college football, but yeah, you know, a lot of things are. A lot of things are right with uh, what went on at Georgia Tech last year. Are you aware of what the Yellow Jackets have. It's one of my favorite things in all of college football. Have you checked out Amazon Fire TV yet? Well, you should. It's your destination for sports. From live games to highlights to in-depth analysis, Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs, as well as the Fire TV stick that you can plug into your existing TV that provides access to millions of movies and TV episodes, as well as free and live TV. Whether it's opening weekend for baseball or the college basketball tournament, you're going to want to have a Fire TV. Fire TV recently created the Fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands all for free. That includes all of us at Locked On and most of the big pro leagues and college conferences as well. March Madness, NBA, Major League Baseball, and more. Not to mention news, entertainment, gaming, travel, and cooking videos as well. Check out Fire TV channels at www.amazon.com slash Locked On Fire TV to learn more. Let's go to Atlanta, not Athens, Atlanta, right? ATL, airport, Coke, Delta. Okay, so pretty sure it's a Delta hub. I look at Georgia Tech in the ACC next year, and that's not a a name. That's not a team. That's not a school that's going to make a lot of noise. You know why? They haven't had a 10-plus win season in a decade. 2014 was the last time, and uh, this guy, Paul Johnson, legend, by the way, was the head coach. He's not the head coach anymore. And Georgia Tech, since he departed, has suffered, right? He went into retirement and the Yellow Jackets football program has not been the same ever since. Well, that is until the last, you know, year and a half when Brent Key took over. So Key was on staff and was the interim head coach after some struggles under the previous coaching administration. And suddenly things went in the right direction. And the Georgia Tech the, the, the faithful, the athletic director, everyone, they decided, yeah, let's let's go with this guy. I, I think we might have something here. Did you know? Listen to this. Listen to this. This right here. I'm going to blow your mind. Brent Key, I don't think you think of him as one of the highest paid coaches in college football because, spoiler alert, he is not in the uh, top 10 or 20 there. But did you know that he's got a better ACC record than Mario Cristobal at Miami? Miami fans about to get mad thinking I'm hating on Mario Cristobal. I'm just stating a fact. Miami's win total is nine and a half this year. They could go over with Cam Ward at quarterback. Georgia Tech's win total, meanwhile, is five and a half. Also, Georgia Tech, I'm sorry, Miami fans, they beat Miami last year. Now, a lot of you may remember what happened in that game and Mario Cristobal's continued inability to take a knee when it could win his team the football game. But Georgia Tech was still in that position. Miami was 4-0, and ranked in the top 25, and it was the Yellow Jackets that seemingly derailed the hurricane season. I'm not saying Miami would have been 10-2, and 11-1, but that sort of loss can sting. That can sit with you for quite a while in that Hurricanes locker room, and they uh, did not have as much success after that. 4-0 start, lose that game, and then after that, they went 3-5. and So I think Miami has its best season yet under Mario Cristobal. But could Georgia Tech do the same thing under Brent Key? Is this a surprise team in the ACC? Well, here's one of my favorite things in all of college football because of all this movement and the nature of college athletics. In the NFL, you talk about coach-quarterback tandems, Reed and Mahomes, Belichick and Brady, Pete Carroll, Russell Wilson for a long time, Tomlin and Big Ben. You don't have that as often in college football. So when you do, I look at it and unequivocally see it as an advantage, something that makes me think, hmm, that's good. That's good because having continuity with your staff and with your quarterback, those be the most two important aspects of succeeding in college football. It's not everything, of course. You know, Alabama's got a brand new staff. They're not going to be worse than Georgia Tech. 
because they've got a much better roster. There are a lot of factors. It's called multivariable analysis or multi-factor analysis, if you prefer. But who's the quarterback for Georgia Tech? Do you know? Do you know? It's Haynes King. Haynes King, who once upon a time could have been billed by some in College Station as the future for the Texas A&M Aggies with Jimbo Fisher. Well, that didn't go very well. Haynes King is not there, nor is Jimbo Fisher, but Haynes King is at Georgia Tech. Did you know he was ACC honorable mention last year? Did you know that? Did you know? Maybe you did. Maybe you didn't. But Brent Key, in one and a half years in Atlanta with the Yellow Jackets, his record in conference play, nine and six. Not only is that pretty solid for a program that had strung together four or five losing years in a row, I think it was at least three under the previous head coach, what, what does that say about where you feel like he's going? Because he took over as the interim and went four and four, and they said, well, that was good. Can you do that again? Went four and three in the ACC. And they said, we think you should be the head coach. Last, last year was his first full season at Georgia Tech. He goes seven and six. He makes a bowl game. He wins a bowl game against the Golden Knights. Gus Malzahn, good coach, solid program. That's... That's got to make you feel pretty good if you're a fan of the Yellow Jackets. So he goes into his second full season. The win total is five and a half. He's got Haynes King back at quarterback off of a pretty successful season. Didn't have an amazing transfer portal year, but they did bring in 10 guys via the portal. They have a top 35 high school class. And again, when you're looking for positive signs at a program that has been dormant relative to its full potential for a while, Recruiting is a great place to look. I remember Jed Fish at Arizona had that. After a 1-11 in year, Jed Fish pulled in a top 25 recruiting class. And out in the then existing Pac-12, RIP, I started looking at that and many others went, wait a minute, whoa, wait, wait, wait. They went 1-11? in They brought in the highest rated recruit ever? They brought in a top 25 class? How did they do that? How did they do it? Turns out Jed Fish knew what he was doing. You got a top 35 class. Look at who Georgia Tech's got to compete with down in the South. Georgia, Alabama, Ole Miss, Texas, Texas A&M. It's all right there. They're in the ACC, but they're recruiting in the Southeastern Conference. They pull in a 2024 class that ranks inside the top 35. That's no small thing for Brent Key and the Yellow Jackets. So that's the first thing. Here's the second thing. 10 transfers come in. Uh, majority of which are from Power 5 schools previously, which is not a sole indicator of whether or not a transfer will be any good. We've seen FCS guys make the jump or G5 guys make the jump all the time, but they're all three-star transfers according to 24-7 Sports. So a bunch of guys who, at least in the eyes of that particular scouting community, they expect to be solid. They, They should be pretty darn good. And so if you look at Georgia Tech's schedule, I just wonder. I just wonder, returning coach, returning quarterback with some talent, who certainly has got room to grow, is a redshirt junior, by the way. So he's seen a little bit of college football. And here's their schedule. Georgia Tech starts with Florida State in Dublin. Oh, my goodness. The first game of the college football calendar in 2024 that everyone's going to pay attention to is Georgia Tech. It's got Georgia Tech in it, and it's going to be played in Dublin, Ireland, like Nebraska and Northwestern, I think it was a couple of years ago. I forget who played uh, last season, but I I just, I just, I've got my eye on Georgia Tech. I'm not overlooking it. Now, the line is Florida State minus 11 and a half. So our friends at FanDuel in the betting community think that "Mm, Georgia Tech is going to be outmatched in that game. I've seen bigger underdogs win. I'm just saying. I am just saying. So then Georgia Tech takes on uh, Georgia State at home, should be able to win that game. Then they go at Syracuse. Boy, I tell you, Haynes King, Kyle McCord. That's an ACC quarterback matchup. One from the SEC, one from the Big Ten. That's an ACC quarterback matchup. Now, new head coach with the Orange as well. So curious to see what happens there. Uh, Then a team that I couldn't even tell you what VMI stands for. They're the Kedets. Okay. At Louisville, host Duke, at North Carolina. I'm going to make a prediction right here, right now. Between hosting Duke and going at North Carolina, who looks like a classic pullback team without Drake May at quarterback, that's going to be at least one win 
there's going to be at least one win for Georgia Tech between that story rivalry, Duke and North Carolina, in consecutive weeks. Then they come home. They come home. Yeah, they, they come and they play at home against Notre Dame. How many wins are they going to have at that time? How nervous will Notre Dame be? I don't know. At Virginia Tech, then they go uh, back home, host Miami before ending the year hosting NC State, and then they'll lose on November 30th at Georgia in Athens. But when I look at that schedule, Miami games at home. Miami beat them on the road last year. Don't tell me it couldn't happen because I watched it happen last year. Brent Brent Key and Haynes King Company got it done. Got it done. But when you think about Notre Dame, Miami, Florida State, do you think they're all completely safe against Virginia Tech? They could be. They could be. I'm just thinking. Second-year head coach with positive momentum, returning quarterback, and a season that they felt very good about last year. Just saying, stars could align. Watch out for the Yellow Jackets in the ACC. Appreciate everyone listening. I'll see you next time. And until then, hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.